Well, if you're like me, if you're like me, you read that and say, wow. Um, I think Jerry's concept for E-teams was a very good bet that has turned out very well and is continuing to this day. To hear more about that, I'm pleased to bring onto the stage Bilal Zuberi. Bilal is a partner in Lux Capital, a firm that invests in um, new technologies and energy and healthcare and other areas. But Bilal is not just an, inventor, an, an investor in uh, new ventures. He's also an inventor himself. He was a student inventor. And in fact, he helped to found the first uh, invention uh, university in his native Pakistan. So um, we're also pleased to say that Bilal is a member of our advisory committee, so we, we seek his, his counsel uh, in the areas of our focus. So please welcome to the stage Bilal Zuberi. All right. Um, why don't we have Phil, Evan, and Evan, why don't you guys come in? We have an amazing panel today uh, to carry on the conversation that we started this morning. I guess I don't need this. You guys can hear me, right? Perfect. Um, it was extremely inspiring for me this morning, um, of course, to learn of all those toys that I played with and many toys that I didn't play with uh, had Jerry's um, you know, uh, work in it, uh, but also to realize the, the way this foundation has thought about inventor and, and the business of invention to encompass everything from a, what we had on stage here, 14-year-old inventors who are so excited about what they're doing to what you will hear now with people who are doing their you know, undergraduate work, graduate work, PhDs, and inventing stuff that um, you know, really impacts people's lives and in many cases saves people's lives. So I'm pleased to um, have with me on stage here um, I'll introduce them um, you know, in, in random order, actually, because I know I have Phil. Your first question is for you, actually. But Phil Weilerstein, Phil is founder of VentureWell that we just learned a little bit about. And, and I think you will see um, what VentureWell has done across colleges and universities um, in, across the entire US. We have Evan um, and, uh, and Evan, both are founders, inventors. Uh, you know, Evan is running his own company. and. Uh, and Kaleo, did I say that right? Kaleo. Kaleo. Yeah. Kaleo is a pharmaceutical company, as I mentioned, saving lives. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the path that student entrepreneurs take. What does it mean to be a student where you're studying, uh, you happen to be working in a technology field that could lead to new inventions, and then you have this spark that somebody like Phil ignites and says, we need to do more with this. Uh, what does that mean, and what does it take, and, and how do you become an inventor to an entrepreneur to now business owner and business manager? So we'll talk about that. But Phil, let's go back a little bit in time. Yeah. 20 years ago, today we, we all believe students are the future, student entrepreneurs are you know, where amazing uh, innovations come from. But 20 years ago, it wasn't so clear. Yet, Jerry had that vision, you were a partner of his and Dolly's to build that. Talk a little bit about what it was and what have you seen change in the understanding of student invention, student innovation, and student entrepreneurship over that, over that time period? Well, it certainly has changed. I, I would say we're, we're certainly not done yet. There's, there's still much more to do and many, many more people to engage. When Jerry invented the idea of an e-team that actually preceded uh, my involvement and the founding of the organization, uh, the idea was to try to develop a vehicle that would enable people to discover the inventor and the, inv and the potential they had to carry things forward. And importantly, it was envisioned as a team activity. So not just the invention, but actually to learn the process and to take things to impact in the world. Uh, so that's been the focus of what we've done. And it came out of a model of education. You know, the program emerged um, from a program in creativity that, that the Lemelson family was supporting it. Hampshire College, uh, and really uh, absorbed, integrated, and um, put to good use, I think, the, the experiential model of education that um, Hampshire had really pioneered, and integrated that with a focus on not just great ideas, but uh, the mechanism for which to take them to impact, engaging people, bringing in the needs of individuals and the needs of society, into the process of learning how to take 
bright ideas and make something of them. Um, you know, the, the way we've done this is by focusing on um, rewarding those with interest with pathways to pursue that interest, doing it on the basis of merit. And it can be merit based on the very early kernel of an idea. Um, in the case of both of my colleagues here, they, they came with very early ideas. Um, and it came up earlier today, you know, um, is this really at a point where you would invest in it? Well, we're willing to take the risk on them, and we're, we're, we've set up programming that's designed not just to provide resources, but also provide community process and to move things forward. And importantly, when we began this work, it was not happening broadly. It was controversial. Go and talk to administrators, deans at, at schools. Um, they would see it as, well, that's the purview of the business school. It's really not what technologists should be doing. That's not what we should be training people to do. Um, that's changed. You know, we're, we're now seeing that this is very much embraced. Society is turning to the university sector to provide solutions for all sorts of problems, uh, many of them problems that traditionally would be well beyond the scope of what you would think of an educational or research activity delivering on. So we have been able to provide solutions to the institutions and provide through the support of the foundation grants to create courses and programs to identify the faculty who will lead these programs and to develop a community of practice around that so that it can grow and be nurtured. And it started off as, you know, sort of lone wolf individuals. It's now a community that affects tens of thousands of students with early stage exposure. And the people who get really turned on to that and who have bright ideas have a pathway to follow. And I'm really pleased to say that pathway is, is now not just open to, to people who have direct access to our programs, but is becoming something that has sort of secondary pathways and follow-on opportunities. And the model has been uh, replicated in a variety of different kinds of settings, including in elite research institutions working with people in the research sector. And that's become part of our work going forward. So it's really been a, a tremendously satisfying journey for me, who began as a, a student entrepreneur starting a company with my advisor to be able to help people do it better than we did and not make those same mistakes and have better mentoring and access to resources. Fascinating. And your job, part of it, has been over these years to identify these brilliant people that have both the spark of genius to invent amazing things that would help people, but also have the interest in taking it forward beyond the school time. And that's what, you know, Eben and Eben, you guys have done. So Eben, I'll start with you. This has been your life's passion, what you're doing with Ecovative. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about Ecovative and talk about when did you know that this is what you're going to do, maybe for the rest of your life? So really briefly, uh, Ecovative is a biomaterials company. Uh, we make uh, healthy resins that replace things like disposable plastics um, and the carcinogenic glues found in wood products. Um, so actually, it was with the help of a mentor, uh, I figured out this is what I was going to do with my life. Uh, I uh, originally started Ecovative in a class at Rensselaer called Inventor Studio. Um, I had a whole series of failed projects in that class. Uh, a great professor, Bert Swerzy, uh, who taught the class. And uh, at the end, I showed him something that he got really excited about. And he was actually the one who saw the potential in what we were doing uh, to have an impact on the world. And he actually had a list of criteria uh, he would check off. You know, is it potential for huge impact? Does it help people? Does it help the environment? You know, strength of the team. And he, said he went through his little checklist and said it, it met all the checks. And um, when I graduated, uh, I wasn't going to do this. I was going to do it in my free time. I was going to look for a job. I had a job. I had a full scholarship opportunity to, to do architecture. And uh, Bert, I went home for the summer to kind of think about it. I told him to work on the free time. And he said, no, you have to jump in with both feet. And I said, I don't know. I need time to think about it. So I got home. And every day, he'd call me. <laughs> Eben, That's funny. are you going to do this? And it was really with the, the support and also the needling of a really great, great mentor that uh, we began and started Ecovative. Uh, eight years ago. And talk a little bit about your first year. Lots of unknowns. You have now have an amazing mentor who's thrown you in the fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do it. I mean, yeah. I'm sure he's right there behind you. Um, pushing. Pushing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> pushing. Further into the fire. Um, but what, what were your emotions in that first year? There's a lot of unknowns. There's technical unknowns. There's business unknowns. There's financing unknowns. 
you know, you have parents, like in my case, my parents were like, are you crazy? Yeah. You know, get, get, that, get a job. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the, the first year was comprised of a series of spectacular failures uh, and also, you know, real excitement. And it's, uh, it, starting a venture is, um, I think, one of the most exciting, empowering things you can do with your life, uh, especially if you, you believe in the purpose behind it. Um, so we had great highs, like writing and winning our first, our first grant application. Um, VentureWell was, was kind enough to support us. They were the first uh, institution, if you will, that bet on us, um, you know, beyond Bird as a mentor. Uh, and we had plenty of lows, like uh, mechanical engineers trying to understand biology. Like, we made a lot of mistakes. The, the fire truck came to the business incubator many times in the winter. <laughs> Everyone hated us. <laughs> That's funny. It is, it is amazing that the inventor's stories and entrepreneur stories often go untold. We only hear about the successes, mm -hmm. right? And we don't always hear about the winding road that it takes us to get there. Lots of failures, and you have to have people around you who accept those failures and let you move on. Um, so, Evan, you are working on Kaleo. It's a very sophisticated product and products at this point. Talk a little bit about, well, tell us a little bit about the company, and then talk to us a little bit about, you know, the, the daunting task you saw in front of you when you were starting that journey, because you knew this was not going to be easy. Yeah. Like, there was no way you could be foolish enough to think that I'll make it pretty quickly <laughs> on the other side. Well, developing a medical device company that we first thought is, is one thing. Developing a pharmaceutical company is not for the faint of heart, especially a second year in college. Um, <laughs> But you know, our, our story is a unique one, and we have a lot, uh, Evan and I have a lot in common on, on our path. I wouldn't be here without VentureWell support and Limelson. It, it just, to me, what's so amazing about being on this stage is just our very first funding came from that NCIA grant. Um, so I'm very appreciative to be a part of that. But you know, our story, Kaleo is a, is a unique pharmaceutical company that are building a life-saving solutions for patients. Um, and, it, and it's a unique one. They say necessity is a mother and invention. And in our case, that was very true. I have an identical twin brother, and uh, he and I grew up with life-threatening allergies to all nuts, seafood, eggs, bee stings, uh, penicillin, air. Okay, not air, but <laughs> felt that way. Um, and as such, you know, like many other allergy sufferers, we are supposed to carry a potentially life-saving dose of epinephrine with us at all time. And what product do you guys know of that is an epinephrine auto-injector? EpiPen, right? So EpiPen's not even a, uh, a brand product, it's a category. It's like Xerox, right? So part of the daunting task was realizing we were about to uh, uh, create a novel epinephrine auto-injector to battle against EpiPen, which by the way, uh, enjoyed over 95% market share for over 30 years before our product came to the market. Um, so our product is, is AviQ. Uh, we basically, like many other allergy sufferers, saw an opportunity to create a, a, a new epinephrine auto-injector, uh, something that can be carried with you at all times, uh, which, which I do. I get to pull it out. Um, it's, an, it's a credit card size auto-injector that provides audible instructions for use and visual cues to assist in guiding the user through the, the um, injection process. We license that product to, to Sanofi. Um, but you know, I could spend an hour on that journey and all the daunting tasks we had in front of us. The biggest probably was, you know, we were very typical entrepreneurs. Um, you know, when we started, my dad was CEO, my mom was secretary to the board, my <laughs> oldest brother was VP of business development, my middle brother was VP of marketing, I was VP of product uh, development, and my twin brother was our chief medical officer. Um, so, uh, we had many investors early on say, you know, are you guys going to take this serious or you're a law firm of Edwards, 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 and Edwards? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and we heeded that advice, and, and so uh, that combined with then learning that we are going to be regulated as a drug and not a device, and so instead of a few million and uh, getting to the market on a 510K in two years, it was going to cost uh, tens of millions of dollars, and it could take 10 years. That was probably the biggest hurdle, but you know, when you're a patient, when you're someone, and now I'm a parent of a child with uh, allergies, and my twin brother is a, a parent of an individual with allergies, and you know that that's something that could save your own life, um, there was no substitute for passion in our company. So this is a personal thing, but I had not thought about allergies, food allergies especially, until my child was born with food allergies. Yeah. I just, just never thought about it. You know, EpiPen is something you kind of heard about, maybe on right. a TV commercial, if at all. 
Uh, Didn't and see a commercial till our product came out. <laughs> oh, that maybe that's I Didn't, don't know where I heard about EpiPen. <laughs> Didn't but, see zero dollar copays till our product came out. So competition but, is good. That's my message. Competition <laughs> is good, but also it, it's one of those things where you don't realize that most parents don't know how to use EpiPens. Right. Let you know many of them forget to carry EpiPens. Yeah. You know, it's only when you have a child who's going to school where you think they may be exposed to this that you realize that wait, there is something. Somebody needs to invent something that solves this problem. Right. And that's when we look around, why is nobody working on this? And thankfully, people like you exist. Well, we've been very blessed. It's, it's about relationships. And you're right. The, the thing that is interesting, though, is when we started this over, you know, when we were in middle school, we were those strange kids at the end of the cafeteria table with allergies. You know, we were the only ones in our entire school with severe allergies. You cannot walk into a school today, an elementary school, mind you, and there not be individuals in the school in every classroom that has a severe allergy. The peanut allergic population alone is doubling every five years. And, and I could go on to why that's occurring. A lot of it is a hygiene hypothesis where we live in a Purell generation where we don't get the good bacteria. My six-year-old eats a Cheerio with dog hair on the floor, and I say, good job, buddy. <laughs> Keep it up. So, uh, so yeah, but you're, you're, you're spot on. At the, at the end of the day, um, you know, it, the awareness is growing, and, and, and we're happy to be a part of that equation. Uh, and, and you know, with our you know licensing to Sanofi, we couldn't have done it without that. And that, that you know, that's a big part of our story is just recognizing, uh, one, we needed a CEO, which we hired early on, and two, in order for us to go against someone like EpiPen, as you can appreciate, we needed a large pharmaceutical partnership to get it in the hands of as many patients as possible. Phil, these guys are working on problems that Lemelson Foundation likes to call it problems worth solving. These are real problems, whether they're impacting lives of people in developed parts of the world or developing parts of the world, sometimes the bottom of the pyramid, uh, completely problems that many people may not even recognize as problems. As teachers, as mentors, how do you motivate people to think about those sets of problems, especially in a society or in a rapidly social media where society where, you know, creating a photo disappearing app can make you billionaires in two years. How do you tell somebody who's this young kids at that time in school that go solve that problem that'll take you 10 years and tens of millions of dollars when you may not have money for a good nice meal at a restaurant? Well, to do that. It, it, actually, you don't have to tell people. I, I, one of the things that um, is really a, a, I think has worked in our favor and is a wonderful sort of commentary on, on humans, is that um, people actually want to do the right thing. And if you give them a pathway to do it, they will. And people who are in the sciences and engineering, they went into that because they were curious. They had a desire to solve problems. But they, they, the satisfaction is in actually other people recognizing the value of that. And one of the tragedies is not teaching people who have that curiosity the skills and giving them the path to actually go forward and solve those problems. So, uh, you know, I think that actually giving an uh, opportunity to experience the process of applying empathy to creating solutions is incredibly powerful. And, you know, we focus on and we're very um, interested in the impact of the things we work on, but we don't lead with the kind of, you know, you should do this because it's the right thing to do. We lead with a discovery process that's about empathy and about understanding the problem and understanding needs. And those needs lead to the opportunity, and the opportunity leads to the process being sustainable and the kind of products that, that these guys are doing. Um, and, you know, it, it can be in a medical device, it could be sustainable materials, big environmental impact. I think the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity, and when you have the tools to realize that and you're able to have the experience that makes you feel like, yes, I could do this and I can do this, you know, it happens. And it's not easy. I, I think, you know, setting things on fire or smelling up the uh, incubator or, you know, dealing with, with uh, challenging intellectual property um, barriers or uh, dealing with the, the how do you go from well, it's great that we got this very early stage funding, but now there's this big gap before we're actually an investable company in the sense that 
it's got the rate of return that a commercial investor would take up. So we've been working to address those things and make sure that we fill in the pathway so that the fact that you're focusing on solving a problem for society doesn't become a barrier to actually being able to fulfill it. Interesting. We, there was a little bit of a conversation earlier this morning where we talked about inventors wanting to invent, but not necessarily wanting to become business people. Um, the patent system in the US has changed dramatically over the last 20, 25 years, certainly in the last five years. Um, and entrepreneurship is now the most common path to bringing your invention into the market so that people's lives are actually affected in a positive way. Um, what are some of the tools that people like yourself, that VentureWell has to provide to students as they are thinking about this, because they are first-time entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They haven't done this before. You know, I remember the first time I took the entrepreneurship course at MIT, I had to first look up the spelling that I had the, all the E's and the U's in the right place. Um, yeah, it took me a year to get that right. It, it's, <laughs> I mean, whoever came up with the French word to describe something. Uh, but, um, but, but talk a little bit about that. You know, what, what are some of the tools that you provide and Venture Wells programs provide um, to, to the students? And then we'll go back to Eben and Evan to talk about you guys. What benefited yeah. you? Um, as you were doing this? So there, there are tools that help to engage people and to educate them, and, and those are tools that are within the educational environment. Um, we have, since the outset of the program, uh, been, been investing in both in, in the form of grants that the foundation funds and also in, in the form of a community of support to help create the educational environment that brings awareness and knowledge and skills and the opportunity to practice those things. So that's both in the classroom, beyond the classroom. And it's things that are um, you, you would normally get, but given to you in a slightly different way, given in a way that's expecting you to do something with it now and learn by doing that. And so exposure to um, creativity and creative thinking skills, design skills, and not just for students in engineering, but for students in the sciences, students in business. Uh, and then providing places and spaces and encouragement to go and do stuff with it. And I think, you know, that's been the case with both of, of these examples, but virtually all of the, the teams that we work with had some access to those spaces. That's now becoming something, again, that, you know, was a big barrier. Now it's, it's very current. You know, everybody's got to have a makerspace. But you've got to do it right. You've got to make sure that it's an enabling makerspace, not a rule-laden sort of barrier to being creative. And then access to understanding and practicing business. Because for some people, business is intuitive, uh, but not everybody. And yet it's not, you know, the, the knowledge components of the entrepreneurial process are very accessible to people, particularly to the bright kind of people who are drawn to the kind of work that we want them to do. So we often are teaching and engaging people in processes that are really kind of a here, figure it out. I mean, Eben was talking about sitting down with um, Joseph Seig, who's here, uh, who was an early advisor, I guess, to him, you know, sort of providing some mentoring, uh, where he sort of spent a little bit of time with a spreadsheet and then left Eben to flail away at it for the next six months. Um, that was actually very important and empowering, but that process of mentoring and providing that assistance is another one of the key tools. And that's something we provide mentors, we provide training and we have extensive training programs. We're also looking to the teams to train them to engage those people and to understand how you cultivate your ecosystem around you, because it's really all about creating that ecosystem. So we've been working to create the ecosystem around higher education and research, and we work with the teams that engage in it to create their own ecosystem and build that. And that's really critical if you're doing something that's never existed before. And I, I, I think one of the things that's most cool about what we do is that you can get someone who, had, you know, as a, a uh, early 20-something can engage a Fortune 50 company and get them to think completely differently about the direction that some of their businesses might take. And I think that's the power of invention, and you need that full armamentarium of tools to get there. And just, just hooking on to that, I mean, uh, we talked a little bit about this morning the importance of, of, of faculty and the, and the role of a professor. 
Um, I mean, Professor uh, Larry Richards and Mike Gorman taught an invention design class, which was the catalyst for us to apply to E-Team. They were at my wedding. Uh, that's how important they were to uh, the journey that I've, I've been on. Um, so I think having a champion, you know, and, 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 and you, know, you mentioned Bert, and, and you, you have to have individuals that are empowering their students to be creative, to explore ideas. And we don't say it enough, but to take risks. Because the reality is the risk profile of these students is never gonna be better to try to start a company than at that moment, right? I mean, when you're talking about now I'm, you know, I'm married, I have three energetic boys, you know, mortgages. If you just think about a long life, those different milestones that can inhibit you as an entrepreneur uh, to some degree. And, and uh, I, I think we need to encourage our students to take chances, to, to fail, be okay with that, change our acceptance criteria of what success really is. Um, but for us, you know, I think the tools that were afforded to us really early on, and it's now transcended is having the right teachers and mentorship and individuals that believe in your passion and encourage you to be creative, to invent, to try new things. Um, and, and I think there's still a huge role. It's still not where we need it to be. I mean, a lot of people in the room here certainly appreciate it, which is why you're here. But we need to encourage other institutions, other faculty, other departments to, uh, to, to go through this exploration and to embrace this entrepreneurship through the means of creativity and invention. Evan, I want you to talk to us a little bit about student entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in general ha uh, needing to be resourceful. Mm -hmm. Some people call it punching above your weight, but it's also about finding resources inside the university, outside the university. Not all universities have the same kind of resources. They don't have invention design programs. They don't have entrepreneurship centers. They don't have financial help available. Uh, but then maybe outside the university, things might be available. Talk a little bit about that, because I bet you a lot of people come to you, younger people come to you now asking for advice. Like, how do we do this? Because you did it. Well, and I think everyone's path is uh, fundamentally different. But yeah, you've got to get creative. Uh, you know, when we began, uh, we, would, we went to pitch venture capitalists, and you know, we'd sit down and we'd start with the words mushroom insulation, and, and they'd say, thank you for your time. You know? <laughs> I, I wasn't one of those, <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to set the record straight. <laughs> um, so, you know, we had to get creative, and we ended up going actually after uh, state and federal grants is how we eventually found a toehold uh, to fund research that we could then uh, commercialize. So you have to find the, the appropriate pathway, and I, I totally agree on the, on the mentorship uh, side of things. I mean, I think that that's most critical, and then comes the programming and, and teaching skills, but I'd be remiss if we didn't spend a little time talking about the need for funding in this area. Yeah. Uh, and that, that critical funding when a, when a venture is, someone has an idea, they're a credible person, right? You're like, this person has integrity, they have grit, like they wanna do it, they're working on a hard problem. There are very few commercial dollars that, will, that, that come to that space. Um, and that's a very hard place to get funding. And I, and I always see a funding gap there when, when people ask me for advice. And I think we, uh, we really have to think about how we, we close that, that remaining gap. So let's think about building out that ecosystem. Thank you for taking me to what I had as the last question, which is, I think, a nice segue into our next panel as well, because one thing that the foundation hears across the board, especially for people who are working in hard to solve technical problems, um, you know, where, where it's deeply you know, um, complicated regulatory wise or otherwise it takes a while, um, is funding. You know, we need funding not only to pay ourselves, even if it's just Raman money to pay the rent but it's also funding to buy the equipment that might be absolutely necessary. It's to be able to hire at least a few people, the technology expertise that might be needed. Um, but it's also funding needed for uh, filing patents and you know the, the basic minimum. What are some of the resources that are available now? And what, you know, give your thoughts. I mean, there's never a perfect answer. Yeah. You know, I wish there was, but there isn't. Yeah, let me, let me jump in at the very earliest stage. Uh, you know, the E-Team grants remain a unique resource. Um, and uh, it shouldn't be that way. It should be something that's very, very widespread and starting to change. The, the institutions that are embracing this educationally are recognizing that actually they should put some tangible resources in. And that's actually a very attractive thing to go out and fundraise around because entrepreneurship is going to actually build the communities that they're part of, not just build the institutional capital. Um, 
The follow-ons to that and kind of the next stages of it are also very critical. But even at that early stage, there's now, you know, the, the uh, National Science Foundation is, has created the i program, which is really targeting research. But it's essentially using an E-team model at the heart of it. Student entrepreneur figuring out with a team how to take an idea forward. That's a small grant. There's still a gap there. You know, the SBIR grants are, are a very important resource. Um, but very often it's friends and family that people are turning to, and both the, the resources to develop ideas around, you know, how to go beyond your immediate frame of reference of your family, because not everybody has a well-connected family. Not everybody has a rich uncle. Uh, and there needs to be the equivalent of that kind of network available to people. So that's one of the things we are working on, is figuring out the network that can help that to work for everyone and to be inclusive. Um, but then you need to go on beyond that and, and into the stage where you've got something that looks viable but isn't yet sort of investable on, on uh, traditional standards. And there are, there is an emerging group of people working on things like this um, and I think it will grow a lot but there's still a lot of work to be done there and it's an area that our programming the way that we've approached it is to try and do the best job we can in preparing the team to go to that next step. Give them the knowledge, the understanding, the vocabulary, help to make, begin to make those network introductions. Um, and in some cases, it's as much about the network and the opportunity for validation as it has anything to do with funding. But the currency of validation is often that early funding. And, and I, I refer to our E-team grants as being just enough money to get you really into deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. Evan, you Can want to hook onto that real quick? I um, know we're a little bit on tight schedule, but um, the other thing I think we need to realize is the power of relationships. Um, you know, our, the reason why we were able to continue to raise money is we made the conscious decision to bring a CEO uh, into our company very, very early on. And some people, you know, have this fear of equity. Well, 100% of zero is still zero. Um, and for us, uh, our CEO was able to raise a significant amount of capital really quickly once he got on board simply based on his relationships, his integrity, his experience. Um, and experience means a lot. So I think, you know, a, a lot of it when I talk to entrepreneurs is, you know, you could have the best idea in the world, but if you don't have the right management team, if you don't have the right experience behind it, it's going to be very challenging to get that, that funding. So I just want to make that point that I do think with relationships, with executive talent, do come some opportunities with, with funding as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we've run out of time, but I do want to say one of the reasons we have Eben and Eben on the stage is to highlight the success stories that, that these were all students, and these were students without money, and not, to the best of my knowledge, no rich uncles who were sort of funding everything. Um, and, and yet they've made it through, thanks to help from Venture Well and Lemosil Foundation and, 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 and other resources that they gathered. And it's doable, and when you make it to the other side, it's really gratifying. It's really satisfying uh, that you've done that. Um, thank you all so much for this panel. Uh, we have a short video to show now while we switch over panels for the next conversation um, that we will have. Um, in, in the last year, the foundation lost uh, a great friend uh, Bert Swersey, who is a faculty member at um, Rensselaer Polytechnique Institute. Um, he, he was a great teacher, he was a mentor. Uh, there are probably many people in this audience who knew him. And, um, and you know, we, we were lucky that, um, you know, when he won last year the Venture Well uh, Sustainability Practice Award, he gave a few words that we were able to capture, and I think we want to share that. Um, again, watch that, and thank you all so much, and we'll have the next set of panelists join us. Thank you. Jerry Lemelson was an inventor and a visionary with over 600 patents in diverse fields. He was interested in a wide range of areas. Um, he applied new technology. He imagined the future. He defended the rights of the oppressed around the world. This is absolutely critical. Our students must be future leaders who will change the world and save people and planet we must insist that that's what they do, that they really do it. Um, and don't let them do nonsense. It's about making connections. And then you have a strategy. 
We need to teach our students to see what other people don't see, to understand, and then to act. It starts with values, and the key value is empathy. We need to go beyond just user-driven so that it's empathy and equality driven. There are opportunities everywhere. My students have to find their own opportunities and problems. So Evan Bayer was in Adventure Studio seven years ago. He and his team were putting Band-Aids on houses to reduce energy loss. I told him that he was doing nonsense. The following week, he pulled this white disc out of his pocket and he said, what do you think? He had inoculated some uh, agricultural waste with sawdust with mushroom cells. No waste material, sustainable. You got integrity and you get what I think is a beautiful product. I said, wow, this is not nonsense, <laughs> okay? You have to do it. Our students can change threats to opportunities. They can raise people out of poverty. They can level the playing field so that everyone, everywhere, can live a valued life. Our students have the ability to change the world. Let's insist that they do it. I had the good fortune over lunch uh, of actually sitting on a table with Bert's family was sitting with me. So I just want to say, you know, on behalf of all the people whose lives were touched, and of course we had some on the stage as well, thank you to the family that's here. So we're going to switch gears just a little bit, but really only a little bit. So we heard a little bit about the challenges faced by entrepreneurs uh, who were inventors in their own rights uh, in this part of the world. Uh, but majority of the population lives in another part of the world. Um, this is a part of the world that's still developing. They're dealing with their own challenges. They have different technology challenges, business challenges, environmental challenges, regulatory challenges, and yes, funding challenges. Uh, but this, these are people uh, whose lives uh, really need support and help, and technology can do that. Lemelson Foundation has focused on that, um, especially so over the last 10 or so years, um, but right from the beginning. And I think this panel uh, right here is sort of well poised to sort of address some of those challenges and also what solutions have worked. What is happening in that part of the world where obviously any of us who want to participate could be a participant in, but also we could be supportive of the efforts that these guys have. Um, on panel we have uh, with us, we have Paul Basil, Paul's come in from India. Um, Paul is the founder and CEO of Vilgro, uh, a very important partner to uh, Lemelson Foundation. Um, we have Soren Grama. Soren and I have known each other since MIT days. Soren is the uh, co-founder and CTO of Promethean Power. He was also a Lemelson uh, AAAS fellow. Um, we have Nicole Etchert. Nicole is a co-founder and co-CEO of Nest. You know, they're a nonprofit focus entirely on sustainable social businesses. And then we have Kamau Gachigi. Did I say your last name right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I didn't even have to practice that. Um, and, uh, and he's the exec executive director of Gearbox, um, which is providing some very unique assets at the disposal of entrepreneurs, and especially those who are inventing real, real world products. Um, let's start, and I'll open it up to anybody who wants to take the bait on this one. Um, Developing world challenges are different than the challenges sometimes faced by entrepreneurs here. Talk about a little bit about those challenges. What are some of the challenges that you just starting off you, you think of? Of course money, but there's a lot more than money as well. I'll just jump in. <clears throat> so yeah, um, what we see for example in Kenya, which is very typical uh, of, of many developing countries, is that because of need, uh, a lot of people are innovative and inventive, uh, and these are people who have a wide variety of backgrounds. So this is from what we call Juakali, which is the informal sector where people haven't got a formal education and have really very little at their disposal in terms of resources, but uh, they're able to innovate around all kinds of problems that uh, you know, are faced by their community and provide a solution that can earn them a living, but it's really a struggle you know, because uh, they don't have the tools 
that typically they need to use if it's you know a hardware oriented solution that they're providing. Uh, the funding, of course, as you mentioned, is a real problem. Sometimes it's uh, it's uh, regulatory uh, challenges, and there's a whole sort of um, an industry around uh, people who are employed by the regulator, the government, whereby they're always looking to uh, to get a little bit of money out of people who are selling things and maybe haven't got a license or are doing things that are deemed to be on the edge of what's legal. I remember once in Kenya, there's a pretty unique guy, quite an outlier, who created an aircraft. Uh, you know, he'd, he'd been seeing uh, airplanes fly, and he's a car mechanic, and he decided he's going to put his knowledge to create an aircraft. And um, to his detriment, he, he, he tried it out very close to where the army had a base. And so rather than getting uh, celebrated for actually having his, his, his aircraft fly, he was arrested. So, you know, there, there, there are challenges of all types uh, uh, presently, and, and these are the things that certainly at Gearbox we're trying to see whether we can solve. Um, you know, Paul, you've talked about this as, you know, serving the bottom of the pyramid. These challenges are different not only, their needs are different. You know, and we can't take a technology that has worked here to say, oh, yeah, if we can just make it a little bit cheaper, we can apply it, whether it's India or Africa or anywhere else in the world. And we talk a little bit about those needs. What are those needs that need to be met by the use of the appropriate technology and invention along the way? So we're seeing uh, a variety of needs, right? Uh, from healthcare to education and you know, sectors of that kind. And what is fascinating about healthcare and education is I think the willingness, willingness of the customer to pay is really high. I mean, you know, in healthcare, when you have poor quality access to facilities, right, I think willingness to pay is really, really high. We're, we are seeing education lifts people out of poverty, but healthcare pulls them back into poverty. And I think, therefore, those two sectors seem to be really, really promising. Now, what does that mean? It means actual schools. It means uh, teacher training. It means content development, pedagogy, innovations in pedagogy development. If you take uh, healthcare, you're talking about last mile hospitals, making primary health centers work, medical devices that are affordable and uh, you know, accessible, technologies to screen rapidly in primary, at the primary stages, uh, and things like that. So I think we've seen a lot of innovators coming up, developing solutions to address some of these problems. And more so, we are also seeing talent who've built, been part of successful companies, whether it's a GE, Siemens, and many others, and mostly in the education and the healthcare space, transitioning to solve some of these problems, which are the big problems that we wish to be solved. Interesting. Um, not to put you on the spot, Soren, but you were living in Boston, living La Vida Loca, and now you're living in <laughs> New Delhi. Why? And how's that been? It's crazy. It's, it's been an amazing adventure. Uh, about three years ago, I moved to New Delhi to help ramp up our operations there in India. And um, actually, on a side, I'm starting to teach a course at Institute, Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. It's called uh, Inclusive Innovation. And it's a course that we're trying to inspire younger minds, bright young minds, to take on challenges that could affect a billion people, which is the challenge that actually was posed to me at MIT um, by Sandy Pentland, who, whom you know, and that's what got us started, uh, one of the things that got us started on the road for Promethean. And what I see with the, with the, um, uh, the lack, and there's, there's a social and uh, constraint in, in places like India where young um, students coming out of universities, they don't necessarily go into an entrepreneurial career because they have certain constraints. You know, their families may expect them to uh, take on a well-paying job and support the families. We we're just talking about this with Paul earlier at lunch. Um, it used to be like that, it's starting to change, but you still see that it, it requires a lot of training, a lot of teaching, how to, that there's, there are other careers out there and there's um, greater impact that you can make in, in uh, social development and um, uh, entrepreneurship. So, um, you know, we have to be mindful of these things and I think it requires a lot of uh, advisors, a lot of mentorship, it requires uh, training, and, and these are the things that we have to, to consider when we take on these challenges. And Nicole, sustainable social development. What does that mean in the context of the parts of the world we're talking about? Um, basically, yeah, it means linking um, a solution, right? And in this case, mostly technological solutions for to meet the needs of the poor linking them to the market and making them and making them sustainable in the market without having to rely on you know large subsidies and so forth so 
this is a challenge, obviously, because in, in the countries where we all work, it's, there tends to be, we sort of work in silos, right? So oftentimes the, the research and development areas are not talking to the entrepreneurship areas, and nor are they leveraging the private sector. Um, and I think one of the things I, I wanted to say in terms of the region where we work, which is Latin America, the levels of inequality and in, in, in equity, you know, are very, very high. And in fact, they, they're at the stage, at the levels of, of sub-Saharan Africa. And what happens is, is that as a result, um, this is even, this silo is even more aggravated by the fact that um, uh, there's privilege, there's ex extension of privilege to a certain classes and to certain economic levels that are not to others, which oftentimes results in um, the lack of access to um, opportunities for, you know, when, you, when we think about, for example, entrepreneurship, um, first of all, there's a predisposition to, you know, entrepreneurship. I've been listening this morning and to everyone here talking a lot about entrepreneurship, and I think th in this country, in the United States, there's this, it is a country of entrepreneurship. But when we're talking in, of countries like in Latin America, um, you know, security, um, uh, you know, knowing, uh, being able to provide for your family, uh, these become really um, accentuated. And so um, if, if we're going to really be able to meet the needs of the, under, of the poor, I think we need to, you know, in, in our countries, we need to recognize that technology and entrepreneurship have to be, can be pro-poor. And in order for that to happen, there has to be a consciousness, right? Um, that there has, there has to be a whole shift in the way that you go about doing this and how, how you bring those technologies and inventions to the market um, is, is a totally different pathway than the way that it's happening right now. And first you have to break down the silos and, and make sure that you know, there's, the pathway is even seen uh, and recognized at the leadership level, really, um, because if that doesn't happen. So I, I think for us as, as organizations that are working directly with entrepreneurs, um, we see that you cannot ignore the ecosystem, really, in order to be able to do our work. Every day we face that. Um, and so part of our challenge is to do the work of, of supporting and, and, and mentoring entre uh, inventor entrepreneurs and at the same time, um, getting the stakeholders on board to create that, you know, that ecosystem that's needed. We will definitely talk about the ecosystem a lot because that's, you know, no single organization, even here, let alone in another part of the world, can do it all. So they definitely have to be working together with other stakeholders and other participants in that. But you triggered another thought in my mind when you talked about the cultural context, economic context. context. Maybe, Kamal, you can talk a little bit about that. You talk about what is the cultural context in which these inventors and entrepreneurs are operating, and how that cultural context may be shifting over time as we're seeing more infusion of technology, more infusion of entrepreneurship, and possibly, hopefully, economic progress that comes with that. I mean, that's the, that's the aspiration. Absolutely, I think that's a really good uh, point you're raising. And, and you know, in a country like Kenya, you're looking at so many forces, so many things have changed over the last 100 years. So you had colonization come about, and prior to that, there were you know, a whole number of different uh, uh, groupings, nations, if you like, or tribes that were living and probably had some knowledge of the neighboring uh, tribe, but not really anything in terms of as white as it is today. And suddenly, there's this nation that's carved out uh, pretty, with pretty much random borders, and all these people suddenly have to sort of forge a new nationality. They don't necessarily trust one another, and so on. And so the, the youth usually have so many different kinds of influences on the way they think, and there's a new um, uh, cultural uh, value set being developed that's always changing. It's being influenced by um, the Western, Westernization and modernity and what's on television and, uh, and so on. So there are so many forces that are coming to, to create, to, to influence people that you're never really sure at any given time what the culture is. And, but, but one thing for sure is that when you're coming out of poverty uh, or at least perceived poverty, uh, and I, I don't mean to slight, I mean there is serious poverty, but sometimes uh, the, the, there is also a sense that because there's aspiration, there's certain images always being 
uh, banded about on television. There is a huge class difference that was mentioned, and and for example, the, in the uh, amongst the very small wealthy set in a city like Nairobi, uh, they all have domestic workers and so on who are, are privy to the kinds of lifestyles and and so on. Uh, so there is a very strong sense that um, getting out of poverty, getting money, is very important. So the money value is is something that can sometimes start to eat away at uh, other very important value sets, uh, like uh, respect for elders, and like just uh, concern and care for your neighbor and so on. Uh, so I find that, uh, as in my context, of trying to bring about solutions from a technology base, I'm always very cognizant of the people who are around me. I've been teaching at university for quite a while before doing what I'm doing right now, and run a fab lab as well. So in all these cases, I, I have a lot of young people around me, and I'm always talking to them, not only about the technology, but also about, hey, let's think about our value system you know let's think about is it true do you really think that you have to bribe to be able to get ahead in business and and why and why have, why have these very sort of um, basic changes taken place in the way we perceive life over the last 50 years or even the last 100 years so I think these are very important questions uh, Kenya almost burnt up in 2008 after the post-election violence so that a lot of the gains that might have been called like developmental gains uh, if it went further than it had would have been wiped out in a very short time. So, you know, how people see each other is really very important as we sort of look at tackling poverty through whatever means this, they have adopted. This reminds me of obviously going back to this question of um, the ecosystem. This is mentorship becomes really important. What are you teaching? How are you teaching? And who's available for you to talk to as you're dealing with, of course, ethical questions, but also otherwise. Um, you know, all of you are associated with um, or have founded incubators. It, it, there's, you know, there's this rising trend around the world of incubation and acceleration. The idea being that you centralize resources in a single place, whether it's physical resources or uh, financial resources or obviously mentorship and advisory resources, so that you have more easily avail easy availability to the entrepreneurs uh, that are working there. Um, what is the role that our incubators are playing, and, and what resources are harder to get for these incubators versus some of the other ones? Um, well, I can add one thing. The uh, incubators have been hugely influential for, for Promethean's work. For myself, particularly, I, uh, we did a lot of, a lot of my creative work was in, in one of the early incubators that we started, uh, my partner and I, Sam, and a few other companies were looking for space at, um, around MIT so we can develop our hardware. And we found this abandoned warehouse, and soon enough we had three or four other companies uh, joining us in there just to uh, share the rent. We just we didn't want to pay so much rent. It was actually very low rent, but we still wanted to share it. And um, pretty soon we had, uh, from there we moved on to you know, a bigger space. It was 12 companies, and now it's one of the largest clean tech incubators in the country. It's like 40 companies or so. And it started with the need to share a very, very basic thing, share the rent. And then we started looking, I started realizing that we could not just share the rent, but we started sharing ideas. And we were checking each other's um, proposals, so SBIR proposals. We would do, um, review each other's proposals, give, uh, give comments, and that was very useful. And then we started sharing talent. And you know, we had people kind of working for one company that was a little slow on work or didn't get their funding. They would come work for us. And vice versa, we'd share the people, the, the technicians, and you know, obviously tools and other things like that. But it, it was sort of grew out of, we didn't have a plan for it, but it was really, really, really important. I think there was some unmet need in that, in that space because now it's you know, serving about 40 companies in, in Boston. And I think it's, uh, there are many examples out there also in the, in the rest what of the world. What about incubators in India and in Latin America? Well, in the case of Nest, um, I, I think that the role is very important, especially at the early stages where you know, there's so many inventions and uh, enterprises that really need that um, support in order to, to validate their business models and to consolidate and really prepare for scaling. And that role of an incubator that can work with the inventor entrepreneur and really help him or her you know, figure out their business model, test it, and pro you know, provide the constant mentoring and support is, is critical because oftentimes there's really no one else and so things kind of just, you know, they never get out there to the, into the market. Um, but also today's incubators have a big role in also finding the um, early stage financing, which is also not out there. So you sort of have to create 
mechanisms in order to, or in packages of financing, um, in order to get the, the right tools and, and, and support mechanisms in place. Um, and so an incubator you know, has an, um, uh, a scaling role in that sense that we can be much more efficient because we're doing this and we have the context and the alliances and we, we're building the, the market in, in a way and we're building the financing. Some credibility. Right, exactly. Um, needless to say, you know, incubators need to leverage um, uh, technology advisors, business advisors, and others. So again, building networks. Um, also, um, be a voice in the public sector, which you know several of us have already mentioned the lack of policy support and legislation, and in some in some cases, vacuum around um, you know bringing these technologies to the market. And so we can also be a voice. Um, and um, so I think incubators today, whether it's a shared space. Mm -hmm or not, right, whether it's, it's more virtual, um, uh, have a critical role to play. And I think that for really, in order to have impact, um, they're, they, they, play a, they're, they, they are an accelerator and they do, they will, they play a key role in helping these technologies go to scale. Paul, what is the role of the government in all of this? Well, <laughs> that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> you know, but I think in, in India, I think the government has been very supportive of science and technology-based innovation. We are a country that produces 600,000 engineers a year. And uh, all that scientific temper, I think, can be really unleashed to create uh, wonderful products, um, hard products, um, for the benefit of the base of the pyramid. I think the government has played a critical role in setting up many incubators. So that's one piece. The second piece is with the new law that the government has actually uh, past where the new companies act in India uh, forces companies to donate 2% of their net profits to, um, to uh, what they call the corporate social responsibility spend. Now one big thing that has happened is the government has actually created rules which force companies to actually donate that to incubators and that is considered as legitimate corporate spend. Now, which that, uh, we've been kind of experiencing uh, inflows of revenues in the form of grants from corporates who now want to promote innovation in their areas of work, though directly the law doesn't allow you to you know, uh, uh, donate to an area of where your business interests are. But all this, I think, is going to trigger innovation. I think the government shouldn't really necessarily run programs, but if it can unlock this kind of capital, and create a facilitating environment, I think there's lots that individual others like co companies and academic institutions can do to help uh, this sector grow. Uh, and incubators in, in developing countries have to be sort of modeled for that uh, context. I mean, we tried to take the same model that we did at Greentown Labs in Boston, try to transplant that into, into New Delhi, and it didn't work out quite as well. And I think you have to think of you know, the, the, what's the difference in the culture, the, the infrastructure? I mean, trying to do an incubator in Boston, which is 4 million people, versus one in Delhi, which is 16 million people, it's quite different. So I think you have to think of how you can change maybe virtual incubators, like you mentioned, um, different, you know, uh, locations in, in different areas, smaller spaces, um, something that people can reach more quickly, and, and having uh, you know, sort of the, the mentorship available in all these places. So you have to kind of take whatever we try to do here from US and try to understand the local condition, local context. And I think it's true for any uh, sort of innovation, right, even incubators. Um, it's true, you have to take that and, and model it and understand the local conditions before you can adapt it. So just one, can I just yeah. add? Yeah, yeah, please. One? I think one of the challenges that we faced is staying put focused on incubation in especially developing countries has been tough. Um, we would have liked to just incubate, but we've had to go backwards to inspire people to take to entrepreneurship and go forwards to, um, to set up a fund to invest in that missing middle, right? Now that's not good, right? I mean, uh, as a good incubator, if you can just stay focused. Feature creep, we call it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, but I, necessary in your I case. think that, yeah, no, that also fair. means that all of us are contributing to building the ecosystem. That's a tough one, but I think that's, that's also how that ecosystem then gets created. So I think incubators in developing countries have a big role to play, not staying put on incubation, but moving forwards and backwards to really Creating build those that, right, the whole ecosystem. that pathway uh, that was alluded to in yeah. earlier. So Vilgro has done so much work. It has inspired Vilgro offshoots now in other parts of the world as well. Um, talk a little bit about what has worked 
what has been truly successful, especially things that you're now seeing seed outside of that ecosystem that you know, the lesson is being carried forward? Right. I think uh, there's some magic that's worked. I don't know what it's worked, <laughs> uh, but there is a secret sauce where we've, I think one piece that is, we've seemed to have improved in terms of an incubation process is how we select companies. I think that's really, really improved over time, right? And if you are able to spot winners, right? And if you can spot some of those entrepreneurs who can be coached and mentored to improve upon their model and pick ideas which are not ahead of its time, where you can really get them into the market really rapidly, uh, I think that piece, which is the diligence piece, is really rapidly improved. The second piece I think that has really worked for us is the way we matched mentors and where we've incentivized the mentoring program, right? Offer mentor equity, offer fees to the mentors and things like that, as opposed to a full pro bono mentoring piece. The third piece I think that has really worked is hybrid capital, using grants as well as equity. Uh, and I think that's really worked to make sure that you de-risk a little bit and that form of uh, blending capital has really worked. And the fourth piece that I think is working is getting deeper into specific sectors and building an ecosystem of support around it. So healthcare, education, how do you build specific support? And I think that's really becoming valuable for entrepreneurs in that sector because you really get, you know, not very high level generic mentoring, but very specific value add. And we're hoping to replicate that in other countries, but all these economies are very different and I think we'll face newer challenges as we go there. So how, for, and this is, I'm sure all of you face this, not all startups work, not all ideas have the right commercial and um, insight. Um, how do you both help those companies realize that maybe it's time to move on to something different? At the same time, keeping that spirit alive, get back in the game. You know, we, the words used earlier were fail gracefully. And part of that failing, failing gracefully is to stand up again. You know, actually, if you look at my cell phone, the screen says, you know, I fall seven times, but I get up eight. Mm -hmm. That's all that matters at the end of the day. Um, how do you do that there? When in a society, in societies generally where, you know, failure is not yet acceptable, uh, and also you have, you're, you're holding their hand a little bit as you're taking them along, and people can get used to that. I think for us, <clears throat> like in my context, we, we haven't yet had that huge success of many startups going on to grow and so on, but there have been a couple of examples, uh, even though at present I would consider them more outliers, but there's, for example, a guy that I saw on television in Kenya, and he, he'd invented a tea-making machine. And so he, he didn't have a degree or anything. He had a high school education and a little bit more than that. But this machine, in the, what I saw on the television, he'd leave the tea and the tea leaves, that is, and the milk in place and underneath in a, in a vessel, there'd be water. And he'd uh, connect it to his phone. And when he's on his way home, he'd send a text and the phone would receive it and start, you know, you'd see like a Rube Goldstein kind of machine, the, <laughs> the, the milk and the tea leaves would pour into where the water is. And there was this little tub that he put a rod on and it would rise when the mixture is boiling and switch off the element and open a hole at the bottom, bring a sieve into place and sieve the tea. Wow. And it, it goes into a thermos and then covers it and then it sends him a text back saying the tea is ready. <laughs> and, and I saw this guy and, and I said to, to the, some of the people in the Fab Lab, go to the studio, find out who he is and bring him in. <laughs> and he came in and we taught him very quickly how to use uh, microcontrollers. Everything he was doing was analog electronics. Very clever, but uh, not he hadn't been exposed to digital electronics. But the point of the story is that uh, the tea making machine, as far as we could see at that point, it may still end up being a success, commercial success, but that wasn't really the low-hanging fruit for him. But he was hungry for, for success, and uh, there was government legislation that every vehicle, every public service vehicle has to be fitted with a speed governor, so you, you can't drive faster than 80 kilometers an hour. And so he quickly designed uh, a solution for it, sent off to China, and got the printed circuit boards made, bring them back, and he is now having many people employed who you know, solder all the parts onto these and, and house it and sell it, and he's doing very well with this. But uh, the point I was making is a guy like him, he's an outlier, 
and somehow he's able to be able to survive as he goes to his next gig, so to speak, many people would give up and say, no, I'm just going to get a job because I can't afford this anymore. So I think one of the roles of the incubator and the ecosystem in general is to be able to pick people like those and give them enough of a cushion to let them chase after their dream until they succeed. And so with Gearbox, that's one of the elements we're doing, even though principally what we're doing is providing the hardware for, so that he wouldn't have to send to China to get his PCBs made, all the housing and stuff like that. But um, that's one of the gaps I think we're trying to fill. And, and I think alongside that is, um, and probably for Ness, this has been one of our learning experiences, is knowing when we should get out and not continue supporting something that isn't working. Um, I think when we first, uh, you know, at the beginning, the early years, the desire to support as many of these uh, ideas as possible was there because, you know, initially as we vetted them, they, they seemed very um, promising. However, what the, one of the other big challenges, of course, is the talent challenge. And it's getting people who can really, it, it's the selection piece, right? Finding those people, as you're saying. And, and, and it's, 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 it's difficult to help inventors make that transition to entrepreneurship. Um, and we're looking a lot at that, at that, and I think we've gotten much better at finding the, 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 the ones that win. But also figuring out, you know, we're necess in the process of developing a talent tool right now to help on, uh, inventor entrepreneurs assess their competencies. And it's sort of an in introspective self-discovery process where they, you know, can tr start to see what are the areas they really need to strengthen and, and, cha and change in themselves. It's a transformation process. We're hoping that that, that transformation um, can, can take place, and we've seen it take place, or at least an honest dialogue to say, hey, maybe I'm not the right person to run this company. Maybe I need to turn it over. I need to stick to you know, the products and the technology side, and I need to find myself a, a great um, entrepreneur who business can lead partner. it, a business partner. Yeah. So that whole process needs to, that needs to take place. The whole um, transfer of technology is very difficult, very, very challenging. We're trying to do it in a few cases right now in Peru. Um, one, not so successful, just because the inventors did not want to let go. But uh, we have a second one that we think that, the, that, that we might be successful at. So trying to find that, you know, either transformation or transition or transferring um, so that we can take more of these um, wonderful, you know, ideas to the market are, is key. So I'll take one minute, and I want each one of you. We have in the audience, we have professors in the audience, we have inventors in the audience, we have funders in the audience. There's a whole bunch of people with a lot of money, too. There's a lot of people with a lot of technology know-how. Um, if each of you could think of one thing that these people could do sitting in the audience to engage with, with the work that you guys are doing in other parts of the world, you know, the, what you're doing to help millions or billions of people, um, what would that ask be? What can people sitting here in Washington, D.C., who've come from definitely around the U.S., if not around the world, what, how can they engage the one thing that you would say? Uh, well, I think uh, if I can start, it's pretty easy for me. I would say if you're looking at the emerging markets, you have to move there. You have to live there. You have to understand the market. Move there as soon as you can. Spend six to 12 months just understanding the infrastructure, understanding the situation there. And then either you're going to change your vision and, 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 and they're going to change you. And, and that's how innovation happens. You have to be present in that environment. And uh, it's an amazing experience. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of ups and downs, but I think you'll be better for it. Lots of things that they can do. But if I had to pick one, I think uh, the, the big challenge that I'm seeing with entrepreneurs, investors, and the entire community is they aren't really immersed in some of these problems very well. So even before granting anyone, supporting anyone, I think giving that first round immersion grant you know, so that people really experience the problem, live in the problem, shadow the issues, right, before they come up with solutions. We're seeing this huge disconnect uh, in value propositions of many product and, uh, you know, social entrepreneurs that we support. The product market fit does not exist. So how do you immerse people really deep enough before they can come up with solutions? I think that, I think, is, is a real requirement. And partly because I'm seeing people taking to social entrepreneurship coming from middle class families, they haven't seen poverty, right? And, and they're totally disconnected. So how do you actually immerse them in the problem really before solutions come up? 
Uh, I think my message would be if you're interested in emerging market countries and you want to get involved, um, you can only do it or you should only do it if you're seriously thinking about a long-term approach. Um, I think that one of the biggest injustices uh, in, ter in terms of our development model and paradigm tends to be that we do things short, once one-year projects with limited funding and, you know, we start things. And then we want them to scale. Mm. You know, it's, an, it's an amazing to me that in 2015 that's still taking place. So I think if we're going to get involved in really solving these issues, it's long term, it's in partnership. And, you know, I didn't get asked to say this, but I think that's one of the things I really admire about the Lemelson Foundation, which is they are in it for the long haul. And they're, and they're doing it in a way that's very serious um, and bringing those linkages together. So I think that's the message that I would say for it to be sustainable. Yeah, I'd agree with all of these, and, but I'd also add that... So you I, got three already, so here's the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for a lot of the people here, they may not be able to have the time to be immersed or to go and live in, in, a, in a, an emerging country to, to have that experience. But the, the, whatever your background, you could be that you, you work with a funding organization or you're, a, you're somebody at a university, you can find out uh, what is happening amongst those organizations that are doing it very well, like Lemelson. Lemelson has connections uh, with so many different groups in Kenya that I'm working with right now with Gearbox, and, and the, there is success already on the ground, and you can either add to that, maybe if there's a fund that you can sort of just add your um, uh, donation to, or if, if you're in a university, you might want to find out, can you connect with people uh, who are doing certain research that you're interested in, and maybe they're at a university in the emerging countries, and maybe you can do a joint research project between two, one, a resource rich university and a resource poor university, and there's lots of examples of that kind of thing going on. Um, so I think there's, there's ways you can get involved without necessarily coming in to, uh, to live in the Fascinating. Country. So, you know, we, we learned about student entrepreneurship. We learned about entrepreneurship in developing countries. Certainly one of the things that Lemelson Foundation is also doing is collecting evidence of success stories and what has worked and what has not worked. This is all information that's infinitely valuable to people who are practitioners in the field to try and understand, you know, let's not make the same damn mistakes all over again. It's very expensive, not only for money, it's very expensive for, because it's time wasted. It's time wasted of sometimes brilliant young entrepreneurs who wish they had been told, don't do it this way, you should have done it another way. It's time wasted of people who are committing uh, you know, significant periods of time. I mean, in your case, three years in, in New Delhi, right? And, and going on in the future as well. So there's a lot of reports that are getting commissioned. I would encourage you to take a look at it. You know, uh, Lemelson Foundation has partnered up with Andy and Include um, that, that are publishing reports in this area. So I, urge you to take a look at it. But most important, thank these guys. They're doing God's work in other parts of the world, and very thankful. Thank you. Thanks, Greg.